I'm kind of from uh, the hip kind of guy. All right. Okay. So good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to the May Forum for the Monmouth Independence Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center. Uh, we are thankful for the Independence Library for opening up the doors, let us hang out here. And we are here today to hear from State Representative Paul Evans. Uh, my name is Jean Love, I'm the director for the Chamber, and at the end of his presentation, we'll go through some announcements and quick things like that. But for now, let me go ahead and introduce Paul Evans. He'll give you a recap about the legislation, um, the legislative session that just ended, as well as look ahead towards some ballot measures coming up in November, and after he goes over a brief overview of some things, then we'll be happy to take some questions and he'll provide some answers. So um, feel free to have those ready and waiting for him when he's done. <laughs> so thank you, Paul, for being here, and I'll turn it over to the podium. Okay, thank you. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My goal today is to do three things. Number one, talk a little bit about the 2016 session. Number two, talk about some of the things that uh, I think are bubbling for the 2017 session. Three, talk a little bit about some of the ballot measures, and I will hopefully be done with the presentation part by 25 after or a little bit before, so you can ask whatever questions with the goal of handing it back to Jean by uh, 45. So she has plenty of time to do what she needs to do. So in the uh, spirit of hopefully be good, uh, be quick and be done, that's my approach today, all right? So to begin with, uh, 2016 was a 32-day session. For those of us that remember, uh, when there were uh, uh, just biennial sessions, this was the uh, first really robust uh, session we've had in an even-numbered year. I say that because prior to this point, even session years, sessions had either been uh, for special circumstances, they had been for um, trying out a every year annual session approach, or last session, uh, last uh, cycle, a uh, very modest uh, priority, modest agenda. As you heard from the news, uh, this particular legislative session was full of all kinds of things. Some of those I'll go over today, but really my focus about the 2016 session is to tell you about the things that d you probably didn't hear about. One of the unfortunate circumstances of our current political reality is that you hear about 80% uh, of the time is consumed with about 20% of the actual material which means there's about 80% of the stuff that's actually probably pretty good that most people never hear about, and I want to emphasize that for the small business community today. So to begin with, we are in a world where we have sessions on odd years and even years. I started with that. I want to emphasize the fact that what we did in the 2016 session was in many ways a continuation of the 2015 session. Yes, legislation has to be redrafted and reintroduced, but in many ways those conversations don't just stop. And I want to emphasize that because there was a lot in the press saying, oh, they're trying to rush through these bills that have not been vetted, not been discussed. And, and in fact, the matter is, whatever you may have liked or disliked about the bills, they had actually been brought up many times before and the conversations had been begun. And, and, and I want to emphasize that because I'm actually uh, quite uh, pleased with given the circumstances, what we were able to do with some of those uh, high, high value uh, issues. So let's start with what we were able to accomplish over the last two years and move forward. Uh, as you know, in 2016, uh, we implemented a six year strategy for a regionally based minimum wage. Here's how I characterize that particular uh, legislation. It is not perfect but it did in fact take into consideration all of the things we wanted people to be taking into consideration. Portland's economy is Portland. There's no way and no reason for the rest of the state to try to compete with Portland. There are some rural areas around the state that just quite frankly have specific uh, circumstances that relate to their economics that suggest that they should be the, in their own category. We needed longer than three years to be able to burn in a minimum wage. I emphasize that because there were at least two ballot measures, one of which would have gotten to the ballot that would have put before the voters a three-year spin-up instead of a six-year spin-up for minimum wage. I believe at the end of the day, over time, Oregon will be proven to have made the best decision possible given the minimum wage and the landscape and the pressures on wage, the pressures on purchase power, and the pressures on small businesses. I know that for a number of uh, sectors, this is going to be a harder lift than in some others, and we're hoping uh, and planning to spend part of 2017 trying to find 
tax credits and rebates to help especially small Oregon employers with the burdens associated with a longer term cost index. That said, given the circumstances and what we knew was going to be going to the ballot, I believe the legislature actually did the right thing. Second, the legislature put into uh, law an agreement, and it's always nice to wade into a fight when there's actually an agreement on the table about getting coal out of our inventory in terms of energy production. By 2040, the state of Oregon will not have coal as a part of our inventory, part of our portfolio. I emphasize that because this wasn't done simply by legislative fiat. It was, in fact, an agreement that the environmental community and the energy producers came to the legislature with saying, look, all things being equal, this is going to happen, so if it's going to happen, let's actually do it in a way that makes sense for most people. I think in, in that particular case, the legislature came together, we tweaked it a little bit, we made sure that public utilities weren't hurt uh, accidentally, which was a big concern for especially the co-ops in Salem and the uh, municipal electric utility in Monmouth. We were able to put in a couple of amendments, make sure that it was a little more fair, and at the end of the day, I believe it's a better piece of legislation that would have been had it gone straight to the ballot. Those things you've probably heard about. What you might not have heard about are investments in K-12 education, community colleges and universities, the millions and millions of dollars put into workforce development, trying to better align what we're teaching in our schools, hopefully to better align with what's needed in the workplace, what's needed in your small businesses, what's needed in the production areas around the state. One of the bills that I'm uh, both proud of and believe will do a lot of things was a priority bill of mine, Senate Bill 1565. Senate Bill 1565, uh, co-chief sponsor with Senator Boquist, is in many ways uh, a bet on our local farmers, our local producers, and it is an attempt to provide a new tool for rural industrial development. And I say that, rural industrial development, very carefully. What we mean when we talk about that is, for those wineries, like Illahee, like uh, some of the others around the area that are trying to get the capital to continue to build and build out their production line, Senate Bill 1565 provides the counties a permissive tool to allow for a five-year uh, hold on value-added, meaning that the taxes for the value-added property put into place, so that in essence the winery or the uh, distillery or the new uh, food uh, processing facility wouldn't really have to be paying for the cost of the new development, new value, until it's able to be sold in the market. It's a five-year window. It's not forever. It's not something that can be renegotiated. It's something that is designed specifically so that when small and medium-sized producers are trying to develop, they have a little bit of uh, a window, if you will, or an umbrella to be able to put value into their facility, which is linked to jobs and productivity, and then all of the property comes back online for taxation at the end of five years. It's a modest step. We believe that it's going to be helpful for the local economy. More importantly, uh, the wine board and others are excited at the prospect because they've been having pretty good years in terms of fruit, pretty good years in terms of sales, but always it's that, that capital that is the issue for de in, uh, development. Another bill that I think is important is Senate Bill 1583, which, again, isn't very fancy, but it's pretty important. We've been having uh, small business forums since I was first elected to the legislature. Some of you have actually been a participant in, in those, and some haven't yet, though hopefully you will be. At some of those events, we've had a woman by the name of Ruth Miles, who's from the Secretary of State's office. She runs the Office for Small Business Assistance, and what her role is, is to help small businesses navigate the labyrinth that is our state government. We actually put uh, extra staff in that particular office. It has had, I believe, seven or eight customers in, in this district specifically that they have helped. And uh, I believe that it's one of those things that, um, especially for small business folks trying to make the, uh, the product, take care of their workers, do all the things that you have to do on a daily basis, having somebody in the state who is, in fact, your navigator to get things accomplished, I think is very helpful. So very happy with that. A third bill that not a lot of people talk about, but I think is something that hopefully the chamber here may, in fact, do a program on, is something called the Credit Enhancement Fund. Senate Bill 1589 expanded the scope and the scale of the Credit 
Enhancement Fund, specifically so that small businesses in areas like mm, Polk County might be able to have access to capital so that as you want to expand the business, you have low interest rate capital availability, which isn't always the case. For some time, that bill was targeted towards specific regions of the state. It wasn't being used, so we opened the doors so that people from areas that still have some economic challenges have opportunity. Polk County is one of those counties that has access to that fund. There's also the bakery and grain processing tax credits with Senate Bill 1506. Again, focusing on trying to get Oregon back into the business of more vertical integration in terms of producing goods from the things we grow, trying to make sure that that was a possibility. And then House Bill 4146, which is investments in tourism, which has to do with a, a slight increase for a temporary period of time to the lodging tax that will actually provide a fund that, if I'm not mistaken, may be utilized or at least I'm certain will be sought after for a project in a community near us, not to name names, Independence Landing. So uh, that particular bill creates a fund that I believe uh, is a grant that could be sought after by this state or by this community. Other things that happen in the legislature are not related to small business, but I think equally important have to do with housing. Right now, if you're paying any attention to what's going on in Portland, the mayor's race, at least from all accounts, is all about housing. There's been lots of discussion about uh, homelessness, lots of discussion about housing insecurity. There was a lot coming out of the legislature in terms of discussions about trying to incentivize more housing uh, availability for both folks that are uh, moderate income to those that are low income. A couple of bills that are of import on that, I believe. House Bill 4081, which again was one of my priority bills, is a very simple bill, but what it, did, what it did was provide housing stability for nonprofits that are currently involved in providing affordable housing opportunities. Had we not passed House, uh, House Bill 4081, by 2018, some 300 to 400 families around the area might have had to go find somewhere else to live because the subsidies to keep those housing opportunities uh, would have perhaps gone away. So we were able to say, before we get into the business of building any new housing, let's first protect the housing that we have and uh, begin the conversation from there. We passed that out and uh, pretty, pretty pleased with that. Some of the bills uh, having to do with housing that the press talked about in the 2016 session, having to do with rent uh, control or rent uh, uh, protections, also uh, having to do with uh, particular type zoning. We were able to <coughs> put into place uh, four bills, two of which I did not vote for, two of which I did. Uh, one was a scaled-down version in terms of rent protection. Uh, for those that are involved in, in property management, um, the bottom line is the bill that the legislature considered went too far, and I was actually on the Housing Committee and worked hard to make sure that what we were able to capture and put into place was a, a, a more reasonable approach in terms of notice. Uh, we were able to bat down and prevent uh, uh, what I saw was an overreach in terms of a guarantee of paying for someone uh, to go move if, if you're going to be uh, kicking them out of your uh, uh, facility. I thought that was a little bit too much to expect. On the other hand, in discussions and conversations and negotiations with uh, rental folks, especially out of the Salem area, the 30-day the increased notice uh, for uh, uh, eviction and things like that was a reasonable, they, they saw that as reasonable, and I actually was pretty pleased with the outcome of that. For Portland, though, one of the things that you know, is, is really critical, uh, they're trying to put into effect um, wide, significant increases in affordability for housing opportunities, thousands of units. And uh, to the extent that we could provide Portland the opportunity to do that without it uh, messing up things around the rest of the state, that was my concern. Uh, there are some tools in terms of tax uh, and other types of incentives that are currently still being considered. I guess the message I want to tell you is even though there were four bills passed on housing out of this last session, that is the beginning of the conversation, not the end. We're going to continue to try to tweak it to make sure that small communities and medium-sized communities uh, are not held accountable for the same kind of expectations that some of the larger communities with more of the capital are held to. We want to make sure that uh, it's a win-win it's a for both 
the renters as well as the folks that are trying to pencil out a, a new deal. So I'm, I'm pleased with the, the progress made on that. I think it's a serious issue, uh, but that's still uh, something in, in the works. The last bill I want to talk about for the 2016 session before I, I, I basically uh, open up for questions is a bill that uh, I have been trying to get passed since uh, 2007 in many different ways, many different forms. House Joint Resolution 202, which was my priority bill and has been uh, a priority for me personally for some time, um, was not a, a perfect uh, outcome, but was a pretty close to perfect outcome. And uh, long ago I learned that uh, if you can get half a loaf or better, you take it and, and smile. Uh, House Joint Resolution 202 will, will refer to the voters uh, the option of setting aside 1.5% of the Oregon lottery revenues for veterans outreach and services. I say that because of this. In Oregon, there are 350,000 veterans that live in Oregon according to the census. But 250,000 of those veterans are currently not receiving services because the VA doesn't, doesn't know that they are here. And you would think one big federal government talks to each other, but let's just say that that doesn't always happen. Why is that important to us? Here's why it's important to us. Because those 250,000 veterans that have earned benefits and earned care are not receiving them, but they're still getting services somewhere. And they're not receiving earned benefits in the form of small business loans or perhaps even direct payments. What does that mean to us? It means this. The 100,000 veterans that currently do receive services in the, in the state of Oregon bring in about $1.3 billion in direct and indirect support. If we get everybody that has earned the right to receive these uh, uh, benefits, again, some people receiving nothing and some people receiving more, but if we bring everybody into the process, the direct benefits are $4.1 billion that the Congress sets aside every year expecting to be spent, but isn't because they're not enrolled. The indirect savings is perhaps another billion or two in getting folks off of state systems onto the federal system. So it's a win-win-win. It's doing the right thing, it's cost effective, and it actually will provide money in a lot of communities because uh, a lot of rural communities have disproportionate numbers of veterans. So it's an important bill. It got to, uh, it went through the process. There were some, uh, uh, some interesting moments of drama involved in getting it out of the building. A recent poll tells me that it's about a 70 to 72 percent approval rating throughout the state. Uh, the key figure here is 1.5 percent of the lottery is about one-tenth of what we put aside for parks uh, by the lottery. But that $18 million would provide an exceptional amount of outreach to try to get people in the federal system. So that's the 2016 session uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, I'm not going to try to stand and tell you that it was a pretty session. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to try to do that. Uh, there's only so much uh, lipstick you can put on a pig. I will tell you that uh, I believe the best democracy, the best republic, the best uh, Oregon comes when people sit around a table and argue it out to where they find some type of compromise. And I, by that measure, I actually believe the 2016 legislature will go down as one of the more productive sessions, even if it will not go down as more, one of the more fun sessions. Uh, we have a lot more work to do, but all things considered in the economy, we find ourselves with uh, a much better situation in terms of uh, employment, a much better position in terms of global opportunity, I think we did what we needed to do with the resources that the public gave us. So I'm going to stop there and open up for questions. I see no questions. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, the governor and Ron Wyden trying to change the voting procedure. I know Senator Wyden introduced a bill that would have vote by mail for the federal elections. Yes. If, if that's what you're talking about, then yes, yes. I do know about it. I, I have a sneaky suspicion it will not get very far this session. Um, though I will say that uh, truth in advertising, I had always had some doubts personally about how closely people check the signature block and everything else until this last cycle where I got much more familiar with it and I was impressed with the security systems that are in place. It is a much more resilient, much more safe system than I thought it was even up until two years ago. So um, again, I'm not sure that would be my priority, but 
Uh, I know that uh, Senator Wyden uh, wants to make sure that states um, that have made voting harder for people uh, are, are told and given an al alternative to making voting easier for people. Uh, and um, I, I don't know what will happen with that, but I do know that he's introduced uh, federal legislation for that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, sir. It's not really so much of a question as a comment. I feel really disappointed in part of your opening remarks, um, actually with the minimum wage bill, because I know three local businesses here in Polk County that aren't going to exist anymore as they did. They've changed their hours. They've cut people. Right. So um, talking to a lot of chamber folks is that that wasn't a good bill and we didn't like it. I'm a small business owner, self-employed. I'll never be able to hire an employee. Um, I don't pay myself as it is, anything I get goes back right. to the business. And the three businesses I know, that's pretty much the case. So three of them paid themselves, mm -hmm. um, and they're not going to be able to pay themselves anymore if they actually pick up part-timers. So I think the thing that frustrates me reading through a lot of this is, is the voters didn't get a choice on this. This was something that was decided there, mm -hmm. and it didn't go out to us. And I think small business owners would not have been supportive of this. The, the comment and question about the minimum wage, uh, I, I take very seriously. Um, we had a number of conversations between 2015 and 2016 with small business forums, discussions, roundtables, and uh, the situation w w was this. Uh, 68 to 72 percent of the people were going to vote for the 1350 in three years. That was going to happen. What we did was try to push it off to six years and regionalize it so that people in Portland and people in Salem and people in Burns aren't necessarily on the same cost of living, so they weren't on the same push. Now, having said that, I, I voted for it, and, and I would vote for it again tomorrow because I believe that we do have to do something about getting wages back to a point where uh, people have an opportunity to earn more by working than not working. That said, and, and this is the part that a lot of people forget, when I try to say it, that was the first piece, and, and it would have been my second piece, but because of the ballot measures, it was my first piece. The second piece is now trying to find ways to make sure that business owners in Oregon, 100 employees or less, have the tools and other trade-offs in terms of credits, in terms of rebates, that were in the works, but we weren't able to vote on in, in February because they weren't quite finalized. We have currently a task force with uh, a colleague of mine who represents uh, the Fall City area. Um, uh, he is pushing hard to try to come into the 2017 session with small business rebates that are specifically for that. Uh, I have a couple of ideas, if, if, offer, if given the opportunity to come back in 2017, that are based on uh, distance in Oregon to get around some of the legal issues related to um, some of the prohibitions that the federal government has in terms of trying to help small businesses in your own state. We're trying to find ways around those based on, on carbon footprints to help small businesses that uh, are actually using products from local providers because of the impact on the environment when you actually do that. So I, I absolutely understand your frustration. My dad is a small business guy with three employees, and he also was frustrated. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is um, I wrestled with the, the, the specifics. I, however, was much more comfortable with the legislature of fixing the solution so that if we needed to adjust in the future, we could, as opposed to a constitutional ballot measure where we wouldn't have any flexibility. And uh, that was a call I had to make. Never lied to you. I may disappoint you, but I'm never going to lie to you. I appreciate the candor. So. Other questions? Really? No other questions? Yes. Oh, yes, sir. I know what hers is going to be. Go ahead. Well, the question is, in the last uh, many sessions, has there been a bill that would basically uh, uh, dispose of bills that are no longer effective? And the answer is uh, yes and yes. Uh, when it comes to tax credits, for example, um, we, we have a very, uh, very driven uh, uh, chair of the House Revenue Committee who takes exception to the fact of uh, any tax credit that doesn't have a sunset. 
And we are actually on a six-year cycle where every tax credit is reviewed through sunset. And if the way the sunset works in Oregon is you need to pass a bill to extend it or else it dies. So you got to get, get enough steam up to actually vote in the affirmative to extend it as opposed to the other way around, which is actually very helpful because you end up with losing. Like this last uh, session, we got rid of some tax credits uh, that, that no one really used, or at least they weren't really producing the kind of outcomes that we were expecting. So, um, and, and again, tax credit, that, that's a term of a phrase that is, in fact, a subsidy. I mean, it, it's a different term, but it is, in fact, an expenditure. So we do have some of those uh, processes in place. I had a bill that I was uh, encouraged strongly to wait until uh, I'd been in, the, been in the legislature a little longer that would require a sunset on every piece of legislation, that we have a review of every bill, every law, because I think, uh, to your point, that we sometimes have an idea that then becomes a bill, that then becomes put into the bureaucracy, that then becomes a program, that then becomes a budget item, and then becomes something that no one ever, everyone's afraid to change. And uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully giving the opportunity to uh, put that into place again. Uh, I think uh, some bills may not need a sunset, but um, I think it should be by exception. I think that the state government uh, is capable of doing a lot of great things. I think that you know government is neither the problem or the solution. We're supposed to be a facilitator. But if we get so uh, much entangled in our own policies and rules and bills that have become uh, ex uh, too old and aged to actually be helpful, we're chasing our tail. We can't really do that. Thank you. Hmm? Other questions? Really? OK. All right, so I know in my job as the director, I get a lot of emails from different groups with um, different homes. But there is a, a potential ballot measure coming up called IP28. Yes. It business impacts tax. small, yes. It will impact small businesses greatly. So for our chamber, we have mostly small businesses. So would you please explain IP28 as well as just uh, let people know what it is, what it will do potentially, and where it stands as far as the actual ballot measure? Before I begin with that, yes. The question <laughs> is, will I talk about IP28? Before I get to that, I want a raise of hands of business owners business owners that are currently doing $25 million or more in the state of Oregon. Okay. I want to emphasize that figure because IP28 has to do with a particular type of corporation uh, that is uh, currently doing sales above $25 million in the state of Oregon. And then, if passed, the sales above that $25 million would be taxed at a different rate. It has been uh, packaged by folks trying to push it uh, as new revenue and opportunities for uh, uh, rebuilding the infrastructure for the state that have been lost largely because of Measure 5 and 4750. I think there's a lot of truth there. For the uh, folks that are trying to uh, fight IP28, uh, the Oregon State Chamber of Commerce being chief among them and Associated Oregon Industries, they've been trying to uh, create an environment where they've defined small business as something other than the definition that is, in fact, in the ballot title. This is a very complicated issue. Uh, I, it has not yet been filed, so I, I don't take public positions on things that have not yet been filed. <coughs> what I will ask everybody to do, however, is to read the bill very carefully because um, I think, uh, on the one hand, it is more complex than some people want to believe it is. On the other hand, I believe it affects far fewer businesses than perhaps some want to say it affects. Um, and I say that uh, because uh, what the emphasis is, is that there is a fundamental understanding that there are some companies in the state of Oregon that treat Oregon and Oregon's economy much like a colony. They don't necessarily invest a whole lot here. In fact, one who remain nameless has been rumored to give out the Oregon Health Plan application at hiring, and they hire at just under 40 hours a week to make sure that they don't have to pay insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of those profits go to their headquarters back in some place not here, Arkansas. Not to name any names. In 
the real world, uh, most small businesses are paying your taxes. In fact, in many ways, you're paying a lot more as a small business than you do proportionally as a larger business. And uh, one of the frustrating things as a legislator I've been trying to help understand and also help try to play a role in is, is recognizing that small business and big business are not the same. Yes, all about profit, all about treating customers well, but in many ways um, we need to have a redefinition and a reorientation uh, about how we can actually help and keep small businesses growing and recognize that uh, the language that some people use when trying to achieve larger corporate goals uh, may not actually be as helpful to small businesses as it first sounds. Uh, that has, by the way, to do with insurance, it has to do with tax rates, it has to do with a number of other factors, um, especially capital, and uh, that is one of the pr profoundly frustrating uh, things that I've learned being in the legislature, especially over the last two years, is that there are things we could and should be doing for small business that ironically we're not doing because the lobby for uh, small business is often the lobby for big business and they don't actually want to do those things that are actually helpful for small business. Now that may be changing. There's been some changes in lobbyists over there. That may be helpful. Um, we've learned a lot as we've been doing the small business forums and round tables. We, uh, if, you know, if I get the chance to serve again, I've got a package of seven bills I hope to introduce that are around small business development. But when it comes to IP28, the proponents will say it will raise a whole lot of revenue for the state of Oregon. I think it will. I also have been around the block long enough to know that if it does pass, there'll probably be some rewrites to minimize some of the impact to some of the corporate uh, interests because um, the money numbers are that big. If it doesn't pass, um, I believe that folks will look back upon it not passing uh, and say that it was an opportunity missed and be very frustrated with some of the statements that were made to defeat it because I believe at the end of the day, Oregonians actually want the truth when they're making hard decisions. All I want is I want an honest discussion by the state of Oregon uh, in terms of how we want to fund the services that we say we need to be competitive in the 21st century and how everybody can pull their weight, whatever proportionate weight that may be. What I do believe is uh, small business right now, from again my dad's experience and my own experience, um, I believe uh, that too much weight has been put on your shoulders and we're trying to find a way to help reorient that. But it's not going to be fixed overnight and it's not going to be fixed with one ballot measure. Is yes. not the concern with that ballot measure based on the fact that it's based on gross income rather than, than net? So, so you could have a, a small business uh, that, that has huge gross sales but their expenses are yes. huge as well and they're going to be taxed really high compared to, to someone right. that, that may have yeah, 25 million, but their expenses are real low, so they're making a, a big profit. It doesn't distinguish right. the difference between that because it's based on gross. Right, the question, the question is for folks at home, it, does the $25 million figure really create uh, uh, some artificial winners and losers because it's a set number in terms of uh, really not being true to the story of the sales and what those are, for example, high tech, where a lot of capital goes into the equipment, it may sell, and it's a very high rate, but the margins are actually very small. Yes, it absolutely is open to that. That said, it was written in such a way that future legislatures can redefine some of those perspectives. So it, again, without getting into too much of, of, of advocacy or opposition to this particular measure, um, it is written in such a way that it knows it doesn't know everything and it will allow the legislature to tweak it. On the other hand, it is a different way of doing business than we've done before. And it does say above a certain sales, again, in Oregon sales, that um, those uh, figures, uh, those sales figures will be held at a different rate for taxation than below the 25 million. It would not, it was not, not the way I would have written it. Having said that, um, if the voters pass it, uh, I think it will probably be doing, it can do much more good than harm, provided we're able to rectify some of those definitional issues. And again, um, it, it hasn't gotten to the ballot yet, and there's a reason it hasn't gotten to the ballot yet. People are trying to figure out ways to make sure that some of the concerns that are absolutely legitimate concerns are, are, are agreed to before we go into the mix. 
Great question. Other questions? It's an opportunity to ask your legislator something or to shout at him. I'm right here. Is there anything being done? Because uh, I know you guys do a lot of work in legislature and you, you get these bills refined and mm -hmm. where, where it says what, what, what maybe we want, want it to say. And then it goes out to administrative rules. And yeah. sometimes by the time administrative rules are written, it, it, it does not have the same effect as, as the bill that, <clears throat> that you guys put together. Yes. Is anything being done with that? Because it seems like uh, it's getting more and more. You guys put out a, a, a good idea, and then there's hundreds and thousands of pages of, of rewriting that in administrative rules. Yeah. To, to, Twist what to whoever is running that that portion of the, the administrative rule writing to what they want, and then right. by that time it's it's set in stone and it's too late. Is the, anything being done about that? The question again is um, what to do about the circumstances when uh, the bureaucracy puts into effect administrative rules that are not aligned with what the expectations were of the legislature or far, far beyond what was ever anticipated by the legislature. And um, the answer to that is uh, yes and no. Um, as a legislator, one of the things that I learned and, and have tried to learn from uh, Vicki Berger, my predecessor, is the longer you're there, the more you can watch where the levers are to be able to influence those outcomes. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, one of the frustrations as a person who believes government can do good things sometimes not, not so good things, but can do good things, is that um, you, you work real hard to get a bill passed that takes into account everybody's concerns. It's not perfect, but it's, it, it, you kind of figure if everybody's upset, then it's probably a reasonable product. And then you put it in the hands of bureaucrats, and some of the agencies are very receptive, and they try very hard to get citizen input, and some have that weeby uh, approach of we be here when you be gone, and they don't care. And then uh, I know of one particular bill where uh, I've had to take two votes on it um, in different sessions, and it's been a, an issue for like eight years trying to get the agency to do what they're supposed to do. And um, unfortunately, uh, we're still trying to figure out a way to make the agency do its job. Uh, now, one good thing about elections, uh, uh, and in, in this case, um, even changes in governor that uh, weren't due to an election. Um, you may have seen in the paper that a lot of agency directors are spending time with their families and, and deciding to go to pursue other things. And uh, uh, some of those changes, I think, help create an environment where you can uh, help the agency be more responsive. I will tell you very frankly, um, with some of the larger agencies, it is very difficult. We've been involved with a particular issue with, um, uh, let's just say DHS, over a particular implementation of an agreement that um, I, I, I cannot express in a public forum uh, my frustration. That said, uh, you got two options. You can give up or you can keep fighting and I'm too stubborn to let them you know, not do what we need to do. So uh, at least as long as I'm there, we're gonna keep fighting. And that's, you know, that's ultimately the, the role of a legislator. I, I know full well that some of the things uh, we passed in the last session are not loved by many people. Given our circumstances, I honestly believe I played a role in helping push back some of the more uh, unlivable parts. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have uh, been able to steward the veterans uh, piece out because I think it'll make a difference. And I'm grateful for being able to do some of the little things we were able to get done. That said, it's not an easy time in the legislature. We have a Cadillac uh, uh, mindset and we can afford a Chevy. And uh, until we figure out how to either be comfortable with a Chevy or the new product to be able to, to make it for uh, a Cadillac price, um, we're gonna be making some really hard choices. That said, I will tell you that positioned in terms of other states, um, I am hopeful and I believe, uh, you know, Senate Bill 1565, for example, one of the reasons I wanted to push for that so much is that I believe the 21st century is ripe for a community that says we're going to be, we're not going to try to go down uh, the, the path everybody else is going, lower wages, lower quality, lower everything. 
we have a we have an international reputation for being the natural place, the green space, the beautiful place, and with good and healthy products. So as long as I'm there, my focus is to try to create opportunities for small business development, innovation, creativity, so that we can actually provide maybe not the cheapest, in fact, not the cheapest, but the best quality and high value products to the rest of the world that I actually think if you pro follow that process, we puts into place investments that makes our society a little more sustainable. But we're in that real, real tough transition time. And um, you know, I, I don't pretend to have all the answers, I'm still learning the questions. But it's one, uh, one you, you know, I believe this session we, we answered some, some, some issues that were staring at us in the face and that uh, in 2017, hopefully, we can clarify and reward the uh, small businesses. Uh, you know, it's an interesting fact people don't think about. You guys and gals know every day, but over the last six years, 80% of the nation's wealth has come from small business. It's not from big business. Well, we should probably make it a little easier for small businesses to actually succeed. And um, given the constraints, we're, we're, we have some ideas to do that. But uh, you know, we're only halfway halfway there. Any other questions before I hand it over? Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, one more. Yes. Um, I've seen in other states where um, delegates are voting for candidates that are getting opposite of what the people are voting for. I know, like, for example, our governor has already pledged um, a delegate towards one candidate. Do you know of anything that, you know, is being talked about as far as, like, what the people vote for versus what delegates are voting for and, and going towards the opposite of what their, what their people are voting for? Is there any sort of reform in, in talks for it I think the, I think the question is: Are there any any conversations, at least that I'm aware of, that have to do with party rule changes? Because effectively, these are party rule changes. I, I think that there is an understanding um, and an expectation that uh, if you are a super delegate or whatever we want to call them that has an at-large vote, uh, you should be representing and reflecting the will and spirit of the electorate. That said. Um, I think there are people in another political party, um, perhaps not the Democratic Party, that wish they had more superdelegates in this particular instance because they are freaked out about what will happen if, in fact, uh, what appears to be the reality occurs. I don't know that this year is going to be the most productive in terms of rethinking the Democratic Party rules because of that. Uh, having said it, um, I believe that uh, when you are elected to do a job, you, you know, there are moments of conscience where you have to think through it, and if you believe what the people want isn't good enough for them, that you put yourself in an at-risk position. Having said that, nine out of ten times you do what the people want because you were you were elected to be their steward. Um, so I can't answer for them. I, I do believe at the end of the day, um, this presidential election, whoever you decide to vote for will be one of the most uh, history-making uh, elections, whichever way, and that historians will look back upon 2016 as either the year uh, the country went wide one direction or the other direction. In Oregon, I hope that the direction we choose is inclusion and unity as opposed to division. But that's uh, just uh, me. After spending 20 years in the military and lots of years overseas fighting wars, I would like it if our country actually came back together again and celebrated and did some really cool things in the future instead of continuing to fight. But that's just me um, and uh, my, my aspirations. Thank you very much for the day. I appreciate the opportunity. If you have any individual questions afterwards, um, Evan Source in my office, we have some other uh, contact information. Appreciate it very much. Hope to see you at some of our upcoming uh, business roundtables and business forums. We need your ideas and inputs. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, sir. All right. So I just want to thank Paul for, um, I know my question dealt with IP28. Again, I get different emails that have different tones to them. And with that $25 million amount, sometimes that's easy to see and sometimes it's not. But the headings sometimes are a lot more scarier when it talks about small business tax or whatnot. So um, I'm happy for the clarification on that. 
uh, and, and, and any further conversation that needs to be had, as well as the overview for the legislative session. So thank you again, Representative Evans.